Please welcome Andrew to stage two. Hello, everyone. It's uh, good to be back. I think this is uh, my third time speaking at S4 by now, so uh, see a bunch of familiar faces in the audience. So today, I'm going to be talking about implementing an SSP21 bump in the wire in an FPGA. And as you can see, the main reason is because SCADA people don't patch. So SSP21 is a lightweight security protocol originally developed by a bunch of California utilities, Lawrence Livermore National Labs, uh, Automatic. Uh, I don't see Adam in the audience here, but the lights in my eyes, it's hard to tell. <laughs> um, so it's meant as a lightweight security protocol for embedded systems with less overhead than TLS. Uh, it's meant to have less opportunities for things to go wrong, fit on low resource embedded systems, and so on. And really just TLS has grown to become such a monstrosity. Uh, as one of the previous speakers was mentioning, every once in a while you kind of have to do a step change and reset complexity of things. And so this is kind of their attempt to go do that to uh, uh, transport security. And so it is specifically designed for easy, as they refer to, bump in the wire retrofits. So if you have some piece of legacy gear, it's running Windows NT4 and uh, talks over some ancient protocol that nobody has sourced to or anything, and you just want to keep that thing running over some unsecured network for a little while longer. It's meant to be easy to retrofit in that fashion. And uh, here's the link to the Fellow Projects website and everything. Uh, they've done a couple of talks about it from, I think 2016 was the first S4 talk on it that I I'm aware of, at least it was the first one I saw. And so the problem is their reference implementation is just a C, C++ source and is meant to run on embedded Linux. And there's a lot of overhead, there's a lot of libraries, there's a lot of other fluff running on there. And odds are sometime in the next 10 years, some of that code is going to be buggy. There's going to be a bug somebody's going to find that will potentially allow exploitation or leakage of ciphertext, or sorry, leakage of uh, crypto material or leakage of plain text. And uh, as much as we would love SCADA people to patch more, I think we can all agree that full, reliable patching of everything is a little bit unrealistic. And so I started thinking about how can we make a system that is going to still be secure if left untouched for five, ten years? How do we maximize the probability of not having a bug that breaks your crypto system? And so that's really the goal, is I want something that you can provision once, deploy, and then just forget exists for five, 10 plus years until you finally retire whatever legacy system you finally put this thing in front of. And so the question, of course, is how do we go about doing this? So obviously, completely bug-free code is not going to happen. I'm, I don't think any of us are capable of writing code with no bugs, and uh, formal verification is a nice idea, but it's also a little bit intractable to do for a large-scale system. So the thing is, we don't necessarily need to get rid of all of the little corner case logic bugs that maybe will drop one packet out of a million or to some edge case. We don't care about those bugs. From a strict security perspective, what we care about is bugs that will cause undesired operation of something, will cause silent data corruption, will cause sensitive information to be revealed. And so the question is, can we eliminate those dangerous bugs, or at least the vast majority of them? So what we really care about is bugs in the protocol specification. If there's a fundamental flaw in the crypto protocol that allows you to decrypt messages under certain circumstances or leak key material, like uh, padding oracle or something like that, if there's a bug in the crypto algorithm, say somebody finds a bug in AES, well, okay, you're probably in trouble at that point, but that is a potential way the system can fail down the road. Then obviously if someone gets code execution on your system, it's game over, they've got everything. And then we also have to worry about passive leakage of key material, of plain text, and uh, anything that can just, maybe not full control over the system, but disclosure of stuff you'd prefer to remain out of the public eye. So let's look at protocol spec bugs. So obviously, if you have one, it doesn't matter how well you implemented the broken protocol. You're still in trouble. So the best way to minimize there being a protocol specification bug as opposed to an implementation bug is to minimize complexity. And so that was one of the things that really drew me to SSP21 as a target for this system is because it has so much less fluff. So for example, there have been lots of downgrade attacks and things like that on TLS. And uh, these are fundamentally, it's just when you have cypher suite negotiation, there's so much complexity in there, there's so many things that can go wrong. 
there's probably going to be a bug somewhere. So SSP21 doesn't do that. Instead, the uh, initiator simply states, thou shalt use this cipher suite. And the responder's options are, OK, sure, or I don't support that and drop the connection. So there's not really too much room for downgrades or anything like that. You're told what to use. You use it or you don't. And also, again, no X509, no SN1. These are also very well-known, problematic uh, protocols that have been known to have lots of bugs. I've personally found ASN1 parsing bugs that led to a valid CA signed SSL cert turning into a intermediate CA for the right library with a few crafted attributes that were perfectly valid. So this is not just some hypothetical thing. This happens and this breaks real world implementations. So then let's look at crypto algorithm bugs. So obviously, like I said, if somebody breaks AES, there's not really too much you can do to save yourself. But if we at least work with well-reviewed, common algorithms that have stood the test of time, you're at least doing the best you can with what's available to you. And so SSP21 is mostly using Libsodium-based algorithms, so Curve 25519, SHA-256, HMAC, and so on. Uh, the star on AES GCM is because at the time I wrote these slides, they actually didn't have an encryption mode. It was meant for auth-only type applications, which is more common in SCADA anyway, so that you have visibility into your traffic. I actually just found out from Adam yesterday that they've started implementing an AES GCM mode, which they had talked about as kind of pending in the protocol in the future. So that is now on the way, and I plan to be implementing this in the near future in my implementation. So uh, let's look at code execution now. Obviously, once someone pops shell on your box, game over. So the thing is, it's actually pretty easy to prevent someone from executing code in your system. If you don't have code, if you don't have a CPU, well, have fun. <laughs> and so my implementation focuses on eliminating this by construction. It's just hardwired state machines. You've got a bunch of blocks of logic connected to each other in a pipeline, and data flows between them. And this is kind of the uh, a perfect example of what I refer to as security through stupidity. And the idea of this is you make your system so dumb and unconfigurable, it can't do anything but the right thing. So here's kind of a rough high-level block diagram of how the system works. You've got your legacy hardware on one end, and then just receive the Ethernet frames, you know, check the CRC, all of that. Optional encryption, run through the Mac and authentication stuff. Uh, I didn't show off the out-of-band logic for doing the initial key agreement, so on. this is just the once the session is established data flow. And then do the transmit framing and slap on UDP headers and IP headers and so on, and then go back out the destination Ethernet part. And so each one of these are physical state machines implemented in gateware with wires between them. And when wires between different subsystems don't exist, there's inherently no way for an adversary on one to, implement, to, uh, to influence the behavior of another. So key material leakage can also be prevented in much the same way. The key storage is a write-only register. There is, by design, no way to read it back. And the key register only goes to, in the case of the pre-shared key mode I have implemented right now, a HMAX shot 6 engine. There physically are no wires from there to the transmit logic. So there is no way for an adversary to uh, modify or tamper with the behavior of the system in order to make it send data that leaks the key. There's no possibility of any sort of a heartbleed type bug because a pointer doesn't even really have any meaning in, gate, in gateware logic. There is no shared address space. There is no RAM. There's a series of FIFOs, which are each physically separate blocks of RAM with no wires between them. A pointer for one has no meaning in the other one. It refers to completely different data. And so since there is no direct path from the key to the output, we can simply say there isn't a way to get key material leakage. And plain text leakage can be limited in much the same way. Uh, as Adam was talking earlier, memory-safe languages are a great way to reduce the risk of leaking data. But are you going to be able to do all of your design in one? You're very often in the embedded world, you do still have some 
unsafe code where you're talking to member map peripherals, you're talking to legacy C code, and so on. And so one of the advantages of a pipeline-based architecture like this is it is inherently safe by construction because there is physically separate RAM for the receive buffer and the transmit buffer and uh, the round storage for intermediate hash functions and so on. You don't have connections between them. Again, if a pointer is corrupted, worst case, you're reading data from the wrong address in the transmit FIFO, and there is no way to get that to bypass the signing block. There is no way to get that to bypass the encryption block. And so the only path from for the uh, folks with DOD background and so on who are used to dealing with red-black separation, the only path between the red and the black subsystems in this architecture is going through the crypto engine. So here's just a quick photo of the development platform that I used for the prototype. This is overcomplicated. It's just what I had in my lab handy. So Arctic 7 FPGA, the microcontroller is not even being used, although I did plan on using it for configuration and provisioning and key material. I'm only using two of the Ethernet interfaces. So I mean, even this is a fairly low-cost development platform. And uh, right now, I believe the prototype is using about a third of the FPGA, and that's with no optimization and a bunch of debug logic thrown in there. So it's not that heavy either. So one problem that I did run into during this project is that when Adam and company implemented uh, the uh, original SSP21 reference implementation, they just used Libsodium for the crypto. The problem is, in the FPGA world, there is no Libsodium. There is no well-reviewed open source library of crypto primitives. And so I would say probably 80% of the effort that went into this project was in the crypto library, because one had to be built. There are expensive commercial IP cores for various crypto blocks, but since I am trying to open source this and have it be something that the community as a whole can adopt and roll into commercial products and so on, it was important to have a permissively licensed, no-cost reference implementation. And so what I ended up with was uh, a crypto library being kind of the main focus of the project. So it is cycle-accurate, deterministic timing. All of the algorithms have for the same size input. They will always take the exact same amount of time. There are no data-dependent branches, no data-dependent memory loads, and uh, no caching, so no cache timing attacks. Uh, there is no resistance against power analysis. That was kind of a design choice, both because it's very difficult to harden against power analysis on an FPGA, and also because uh, thinking about it from a threat modeling perspective, once someone has oscilloscope probes on your SCADA system, you've kind of already lost. <laughs> You're well beyond the point of an inline encryptor being able to save you anything. They can just go unplug your clear text side cable and plug their packet sniffer into your black side interface and game over. And so uh, I am very much interested in getting third-party reviews of the crypto code. I would like to get more eyes on it and hopefully make it kind of become a industry standard open library because, as I mentioned, there is no existing standard crypto library. I found a bunch of implementations of things like SHA-256 because there's so many Bitcoin miner FPGA cores out there, but things like elliptic curve crypto, there really just weren't any good reference implementations out there. So what I have right now is I have X25519, HMAC, SHA-256, and then a Fortuna-based random number generator. I did uh, depart slightly from the original Schneier paper on Fortuna in that instead of using AES for the output PRNG, instead I'm using essentially a counter mode HMAC. This is just because I didn't have an AES implementation thrown in there yet. As soon as AES is finished, then I'll swap that out. So AES GCM is still in progress, but the intention is basically to implement the same primitives as Libsodium. Uh, Chacha 20, Poly 1305 is probably going to be on the list at some point. I may do a NIST curve at some point as well. And again, I am very interested in getting additional third-party reviews of the code. I want more eyes on it. I would like to make this become a standard implementation. So now let's go back to the actual protocol implementation. So it's a very simple Layer 2 VPN one byte of header data, and then Ethernet frames. And again, the goal is simplicity. I'm not necessarily targeting massive performance. We're not expecting to be pushing wire speed 40 gigabit Ethernet over here because we don't need to. I don't think anybody here has a SCADA system that's moving 40 gigs a second of data. And so the focus is on simplicity of implementation and minimal probability of there being a bug. So 
Although packet fragmentation is inherently unavoidable in any uh, encapsulation of Ethernet frames, because you can always have an incoming frame be the size of the MTU, and if you add any authentication tag on top of there, it will be bigger. So there has to be some way to fragment. So my fragmentation scheme is absurdly simple. I either have a unfragmented frame, the first half of a fragmented frame, or the second half. There's no fragment offset, no variable length packets. Just concatenate these two and you're done. And so since it is running at layer two, this makes the VPN transparent to whatever you're running over it. So no reconfiguration of the endpoints. It doesn't matter if you're running DECnet or BACnet. You can put anything you want over it as long as it has Ethernet frames, then it'll fit in transparently. And the intention is both ends of the link think that two of these units paired back to back are an Ethernet cable. And you provision the destination IP addresses, you provision the keys, deploy it, and forget about it. So at the moment, the implementation of the core SSP21 protocol is essentially complete. The handshake completes successfully, and we've verified that the uh, official reference implementation does interoperate. Right now, only the pre-shared symmetric key implementation, or the only the pre-shared symmetric key implementation is there. We do have the crypto code for pre-shared public key. The certificate parsing logic for ECC certificates is next in the list of things to do. These are not plugged into the core protocol logic, so you can't use them yet. But again, the crypto code is there. That's most of the hard work, so it shouldn't be that hard to finish. The actual VPN framing protocol is still a work in progress. Uh, but again, it's, it's not that much additional work. Uh, I dared to tempt the demo gods, and they sent me a plague of water. And uh, as much as I would love an indoor swimming pool, I don't think my guest bedroom is the best spot for one. So I spent the last week dealing with that instead of writing up the VPN protocol. So my apologies for not having a demo. <laughs> so at this point, we're using about a third of a 100K cell Arctic 7 FPGA. There, again, is significant room for optimization. Right now, I believe I have four or five SHA-256 engines in there just because it was simpler to have one for every spot where I did a SHA rather than trying to arbitrate between them. So there's a lot of room for resource sharing. There's a lot of room for optimization. I can probably cut this gate area in half, if not more. But my focus initially was on delivering a proof of concept and demonstrate both interoperability with reference implementation, demonstrate security benefits compared to a implementation in a non-memory safe language like C, and uh, then really make it be a test bed that people can build off of and integrate into products and uh, use for future research. So that's all I got at this point. I will take questions. As far as the code goes, uh, uh, I have links to the two different repos. The IP cores repo has a lot of the crypto logic and the protocol engine, and then the SSP21 VPN repo is the higher level VPN framing, the pinout files, and all of that stuff. So you're probably going to want to grab both of them if you look to play with it. I was just curious, you were trying to do some fast numbers. You said it was really relatively cheap to put together. Do you know exactly how much money it cost? Uh, I know you so the prototype it. was using a system on module. I want to say the low volume production cost for that prototype is about 200 in parts. That's DigiKey Quantity 1 prices. Um, then the carrier board is probably, I don't know, another 50 or so in parts plus the boards. Uh, any commodity uh, FPGA dev board with two Ethernet ports would work. The only reason that I use this one is because most of the other ones I had on hand didn't have two Ethernet ports. It's a, a lot of the lower cost dev kits don't have them. But the FPGA I'm using is about $110 on DigiKey, again, in quantity one with no volume discount. And I'm using a third of it in an unoptimized version. So you could probably get it down to maybe $20, $30 worth of FPGA in quantity one and probably less than five in production volume. Okay, great. One more question. Uh, two, <clears throat> where do you hide private key? How do you, how do you deal with a local crypto memory kind of thing for hiding secrets? And then the second question is, um, does it work with any protocol, any application layer protocol? Okay, so uh, let's address those one at a time. So as far as secret storage, the Prototype implementation right now, like I said, is still a work in progress. The key is, I think, hard-coded all zeros. Um, the longer-term plan is to have this integrate into a larger system. I'm not trying to make 
my reference implementation be a product. I want it to be something you key and you set up. So the most common way you would do this is uh, most of the modern, decently high-end FPGAs have a secure boot mode where you can encrypt the bitstream with a key fused into the chip. And so if you then have a second key used to encrypt external flash or something like that, you would be able to securely provision the device, store the key encrypted in external flash. That being said, in the typical application this is being deployed in, once someone has physical access to it, they also have physical access to the clear text network that's protecting. So tamper resistance is not really the biggest concern in this particular application. And uh, sorry, what was the other question? Uh, application layer protocol, Any, anyone? Yeah, essentially anything will run over it. That's specifically why it went with a layer two tunnel instead of a layer three. So it will take in any Ethernet frame, slap an SSP21 header on it, and spit it out the other end. So as long as it's running over 802.3 framing, it will take anything. And certainly you could implement one that will do RS-232 or RS-45 or any of the other common uh, link protocols in use. I went with Ethernet just because it is in common use, and I already was going to put Ethernet on there for the internet-facing side. Thanks, Andrew. This is obviously really gratifying for me personally to see somebody implementing this besides me. So I, I don't have a question for you, but I just wanted to like say to the community as a whole that you know, although we haven't quite gotten to standardization as quickly as we'd like to, we still have you know two large vendors in, in electric power now looking at SSP21 in research environments mostly related to the quantum key distribution stuff, but this is really good stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is that a question? One or? more. Yeah. So one yeah. more question. So we had talked earlier about Modbus and some other problems associated with that and a whole bunch of inverters. How would you see this fitting into a solution of that problem? So the application I'm targeting specifically for this is communications between an outstation and some sort of a central collector or something like that where you're passing data over the internet. Uh, as far as in substation communications, then uh, it's less of an issue because it is a somewhat physically secure location. I'm Certainly you home, could... Home solar panels, something like that. Oh, but, sorry. I mean, we I talked about say. Huawei and a few other problems that we're all seeing with these things on homes, and they're going to expand. Do mm -hmm. you see a, an architecture where this fits in and helps solve that problem? So my specific uh, use case for the prototype was a bump in the wire, but since the implementation is open source, I am hoping that people will be able to integrate it into products and make it so that you don't have clear text on the wire going back to the, uh, like, the bump in the wire is a retrofit design that is used when you have legacy SCADA gear that does not support an encrypted protocol. Yeah. But the long-term hope is that it will be integrated into products and you will not have clear text at any point leaving yeah. the chip. Yeah, I was just going to point out that there's no reason that you can't have a software implementation of SSP21 at the front end and something like Andrew's hardware implementation in front of like legacy hardware. The two are the same protocol and could interoperate and then you don't have to roll trucks to do, to do upgrades, a technician can just install something like Andrew's hardware solution. Cool. Yeah, really the goal that I was going for was I want something that's as dumb and uh, essentially outside of your security model as a USB UART. It's kind of what I'm going for. You hook it up, you set the baud rate, and you're done. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you.